Our gospel lesson for today comes from the Gospel of John, beginning with the 21st chapter. After Easter, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing, and they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you no fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. <clears throat> He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. May God add to us rich blessings on the reading and the hearing of this holy word. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In its elementary this year, one of the things that we have been doing is memorizing the names of the disciples. And you may or may not be able to name them off, but one of the reasons for that is that it's really confusing in the Bible. They're called by nicknames and they've given other names to people and it's kind of confusing. There are also two Simons and two people named James. Uh, it's, it's a confusing thing. But one of the first things that happens in the gospel after Jesus goes and calls the fishermen to be his disciples is that he gives the first Simon a nickname, the nickname Peter, which you probably know means rock. So it's sort of like they started calling him Rocky. You know, we've got this Simon and then we got Rocky over here. It happens that by the time that the resurrection occurs, it's such a popular nickname that that's how Peter is referred to, by that name and not by his given name. Now, I don't know if it is a universal thing that happens in families with parents, but in my family, if there was trouble brewing, you were not called sweetie 
or honey, we knew that if I heard the words Barbara Ann or my sisters, Susan Kathleen, tr there was trouble in paradise. And so in this lesson today in the scripture, we see a time in which Peter and the disciples have heard about the resurrection. And for one reason or another, they seem to go back to their old life, to what they knew, to fishing. And while they are there, they rush to shore, they eat this meal with Jesus. And then Jesus brings out that dreaded full name. He doesn't talk to Rocky anymore. After the meal, he says to him, Simon, son of John. Now that sounds really cumbersome in, in English. In Greek, it's not so bad. It's like Shimon Iwanu. It's kind of more smooth. It's not like when we would say, Barbara, daughter of Bernice. You know, it sounds so formal. But Jesus brings out that name and says to Simon, son of John, do you love me? And when the answer is yes, he says to Simon, feed my sheep. So here he has been, it's after the resurrection, he's calling him by his given name, and he says it's time to put down the fishing nets. Instead, you're going to take over the job that I have been doing as being a shepherd to the flock. Jesus talked about himself as the good shepherd, and now he says to Peter and to us, you've got to take over some of this responsibility. What does that actually mean for us? Well, earlier in the gospel, in the 10th chapter of John, Jesus describes what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd is one who opens the gate for the sheep, who calls the sheep by their name, and is one who is willing to give up their life for the sheep. So first, what, what does it mean that we open the gate for sheep to come into the comfort and safety of the sheepfold? Peter and I also, since I'm up here, we have a literal chance to maybe preach the gospel, but we also, all of us, have a chance to speak of the gospel to some. There's a quote that's attributed to St. Francis that says, preach the gospel every day, and if necessary, use words. For whom are you opening the gate to the sheepfold and welcoming that person in. Every year in our church, we have lots of baptisms. We're averaging about 45 baptisms a year. There are many churches that only have a baptism once every year or two. In fact, we have them so frequently that I bet a lot of you can almost say the baptismal liturgy in your head. But this is the part where you always answer, Everybody stands up and the person reads, Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this child the good news of the gospel, to help them know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen their family ties with the household of God? And of course, we stand up and we say, I do. How are we opening the gate to the sheepfold for others? Not just for children, but to people that we meet every day. I find in my experience that sometimes it's actually harder to do that with your own family than it is with other people's families. I think I've mentioned uh, a time before that I'm the baby cousin. Out of all my cousins, I'm the baby, and they still treat me like a baby. When my aunts and uncles called up and, and said, oh, you know, the other relative was in the hospital for several weeks and they almost died, but we didn't want to tell you because we didn't want to upset you. I thought, I'm 64. <laughs> what do you think my job is? That, Somebody going into the hospital is going to upset me that much, but I'm still the baby cousin in that family. So sometimes our own family is not the person that we're able to speak to the most effectively, but for whom are we opening the gate? 
And on the other hand, are there people in whose faces we're slamming the gate shut? Are there people for whom our words and actions are actually turning them away from the gospel? Uh, Mary Kathleen is still doing children's church, but I'll give her this advice later. I used to drive uh, long trips with the youth, and we'd be driving in the bus, and as people, the students would get bored, and they would think of some creative ways to entertain themselves out the windows with the passing motorists. And we would, some of you are here, I see some of you. And we would have to remind everybody that the name of the bus, the name of the church is written right there, Westminster Presbyterian, Greenville, South Carolina. We don't want our actions to turn people away from the gospel. We don't want people to say, if that's the way people act who are followers, then we don't want to be part of that sheepfold. So taking over the job of the good shepherd means opening and closing the gate, and that's a big responsibility for us. How are we doing that in this post-Easter time? A second job that is given to us if we follow the work of the Good Shepherd is that of being able to call the sheep by their name. Now, Westminster, as you know, does an amazing job of caring for people all over the world. There are people who are alive today because of medical care that you help provide. And there are people who are able to be self-sufficient who have the prospect of a job with a living wage because of the education that you have helped give. And there are women and men and children tonight who will not go to bed hungry because of the meals that you have fed them. All of that is amazing and important. But in taking on the task of caring for God's sheep, who is it that you are able to call by name? You know, it always felt when I, as a parent of small children, that everybody was always calling my name. And even as I get older, there's always that people calling on us to do things. I remember one time when my kids were little, I thought if, if they say my name one more time, I'm going to lose it. And so I said, I'm gonna lock myself in the bathroom for two minutes, just so that I can hold it together. And they came up to the door and they're going, mommy, mommy. So people are calling our names, but who are we calling by name in our ministry to them? The prophet Ezekiel says that the good shepherd is someone who uh, helps the lost and the strayed and the wounded and the weak. Whose name like that are you calling? You know, when I do that kind of ministry, when we participate in that, it kind of gives us a good feeling that we're doing something that makes us almost feel like we should give ourselves a pat on the back. But it also may be that we are also called to preach to the entitled and the greedy and the self-centered and the irritating. Maybe it's those folks who need to hear the gospel message from us as much, if not more, than the others that we help. Maybe we can help turn them into apprentice shepherd helpers uh, who can aid in the task. So who are you calling by name in your ministry this week after the resurrection? Now, a third thing that a good shepherd does, according to John 10, Jesus says that a good shepherd is willing to give up their life for the sheep. Of course, Jesus has already done that for us. He had the irony of riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the Thursday after that, hearing them cry, crucify him, or the Friday, sorry. Um, he felt the loneliness in the Garden of Gethsemane as his best friends fell asleep while he was praying. He felt the sting of betrayal and he felt the agony of the cross and hopefully, we will never come close 
to having to physically give up our lives the way that he did. Simon Peter ends up doing that exactly, dying for Christ. And there are people in the world even today who are losing their lives because of their faith. We hopefully won't be in that literal way of losing our lives. Uh, probably some of you have seen the Dr. Phil show, and there's a formula that Dr. Phil uses on most of, many of the shows, and that is there's somebody who has a problem, and Dr. Phil talks to them, sometimes gives them a little harsh talk, and then hopefully their life gets better. And many times it will be a young mother who finds herself having made bad decisions that are affecting her children. Uh, she might have substance abuse issues or mental illness or be abused by someone in her family. And oftentimes, Dr. Phil will ask this question. I know you love your child. Are you willing to give up your life for your child? <coughs> the inevitable answer is yes. Then Dr. Phil says, if you're willing to give up and die for your child, are you willing to live for your child? Are you willing to make the harsh decisions that you need to make to actually live for another person? <clears throat> that question is a lot harder to actually answer. Are you willing to live to dedicate your life to the work that the Good Shepherd calls us to do? That's a tall order. Are you taking care of yourself physically and mentally and emotionally so that you can be that person that does that work? And what are you doing to prepare yourself spiritually to be able to be the person whose life is dedicated to the risen Christ? It's one thing to say, I die for you, Jesus. In fact, Peter says that at the Last Supper and then just a few hours later denies Jesus three times. Now Jesus is asking Peter to live for him, to give up the familiar, the old ways, to rededicate the rest of his life in service to those that Jesus loves. If you love me, Jesus says, you will do this. So a good shepherd is able to open the gate to welcome in the sheep, is able to call the sheep by name with tenderness and care, and is willing to lay down their life for the sheep. It's a really difficult task. <coughs> Psalm 23 is something that has been read for thousands of years, and literally billions of people have been comforted by those words. When I contemplate it, I, I can actually, I think, feel my blood pressure go down, and I feel a calmness when I think that God loves and cares for me so much. But now that the resurrection has occurred, is Jesus asking me to be to others what the Good Shepherd God has been to me. What kind of a task is that? I, I don't know if I can even do a tiny bit of it. It's a tough assignment that we're asked to do. How is it possible for us to bring that comfort? But remember, as the psalmist tells us, God has anointed our heads with oil and our cups are overflowing. At least the smallest we can do is take some of that overflow and share it with the people and the world that our loving God has created. On the shore of Galilee, after Easter has been made real, Jesus says, Simon, son of John. Jesus says, Barbara Ann. Jesus says, fill in your name here. Do you love me? If the answer is yes, Jesus calls us to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. 